Hello and welcome, Rick's Rant. Uh, for this month, we have a special guest. Actually, we have two special guests. We have uh, Rachel Linder, who is, uh, works with the Mayo Group and who uh, is in the emergency department there, as you might have guessed. Rachel actually got off her shift three hours ago, and uh, so she's a little, a little tired. And I also have our guest, uh, Dr. Amish Shah. And Rachel actually is the one who precipitated this interview. Rachel uh, knows of Dr. Shah down here. I live in Arizona one week a month, and uh, I, I have not been familiar with this, but I have been familiar with some of the issues that uh, Dr. Shah has been involved with. And so I want to get into um, some of this. Rachel, good morning, and Dr. Shah, good morning. Hi there. Morning. Amish, Thank you for can I call me. you Amish? It's, it's Amish. Amish. Yeah. I had the wrong emphasis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All right. So you are a member of the Arizona legislature. And um, I, I'm really curious about your journey because I personally think that emergency physicians are ideal physicians to be members of the legislature in their states and that uh, you can, your impact can be potentially extraordinary. And we're going to show what, in fact, you've done. And Rachel, jump in here anytime you're you're uh, you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So tell me a little bit about um, your background and um, and some of the things that you've done in the journey to where you are now. Well, I've, I've been really lucky. I've had a wonderful career in emergency medicine. I, I graduated residency at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx. Uh, still keep up in touch with a lot of my residents from there, and we we had a, a really tight knit group. Uh, our class and the classes around us. So um, had a lot of fun. After that, I, I became a faculty member at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in Manhattan. Um, again, same thing, a lot of camaraderie there. And I miss a lot of the folks that, that I worked with there in New York. Um, while I was there, I, I did work with the New York Jets and the NFL. We did a little bit of uh, work trying to standardize the emergency care across the league with all 32 teams. That led to a sports medicine fellowship. I was getting more interested and I wanted to get the actual board certification. So I came to the University of Arizona in Tucson and finished a one-year sports medicine fellowship. I was supposed to go back to Mount Sinai to continue to build their sports medicine practice and work with the folks there. But I kind of fell in love with Arizona and uh, decided to stay. Uh, over the next several years, I worked at emergency departments all over the state, um, from Bullhead City to Cottonwood to Yuma. And, and uh, it, it was a, a certainly different type of practice uh, and uh, enjoyed it too. Um, but after a few years of that, I, I said, you know, I kind of wanted to see an impact um, from, from my life uh, to, outside of the emergency department. I and mean, we, we can control what happens within the four walls, but we can't control what comes in through the front door. Public policy, politicians kind of control that. Well, anyway, so, so I'd gotten involved in, in some charity work. Um, I contributed to children's charities and animals charities uh, as, as sort of my big passions. And, and, you know, I just had a little curiosity about politics. So one day I Googled uh, nearest political meeting to me and uh, I, there, there was one in North Scottsdale, um, and I, I lived only a few miles from there at the time. So I showed up, and, and mostly it's um, women who, a uh, little older demographic, all drinking champagne and mimosas over lunch at the Starfire Golf Club. Uh, they call it the Blue Tuesday group, and, and I showed up, and, and they said, who are you, young man? And I said, Hi, my name is Amish. I live down the street. And they, and they said, well, what are you running for? And I said, no, 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 I'm not running for anything. And they looked at me and they said, yes, you are. <laughs> and they grabbed me. They took me to their leader who was at the front of the room, <laughs> uh, a woman I'm still friends with by the name of Linda. And, and she, she said, what? No, what, what is this? You're, you're a, a physician and you just showed up here? I said, yeah, I just wanted to kind of see what's going on. And, and she said, well, I have just the guy for you. Um, there's a, an emergency physician by the name of Eric Meyer, who was the House Minority Leader in here in Arizona for for a while. Really? And yeah, and and so um, I met with him. We sat down, we talked for a while, and he said, "Well, why don't you come volunteer on my campaign?" And you know, that's kind of how it started. And and then eventually, um, I moved to a different house. A seat opened up in in the district where I was living, and so I threw my hat in the ring and I won. And and so there we are. <laughs> 
Well, congratulations. Um, that that in itself is kind of a, a, a special accomplishment. And I'm always interested in things that uh, emergency physicians do that are not, you know, strictly clinical. Uh, and in that regard, I have to acknowledge uh, Rachel. Rachel and I do a thing called Risk Management Monthly with Greg Henry. And uh, Rachel is a MDJD, and I um, admire you tremendously uh, for the getting that. And plus, she's the mom of two kids. Superwoman. True story. Uh, Someday I will have blue hair. <laughs> you know, honestly, that is what you see here. I mean, I, I live in California three weeks a month. And when I come down here and I go to Costco, there is all of these uh, very thin, very, their, their skin is looks like a football because they've been out in the sun so much down here. They're thin. And the cars in the parking lot at the uh, Albertsons here, they're, they're all uh, very high-end cars. It's like, this is not California. <laughs> this is a lot, a lot different, at least in Scottsdale it is. Uh, I used to, Dr. Sh uh, Amish, I got to practice that a little bit. Uh, I was a doctor at Parker. Did you ever work at Parker, Arizona? No. No, um, you missed out a, a lot. I said, that's a big <laughs> hole in your career right now. We got to fix that. In any case, uh, so I read a story about you. Rachel and I basically came upon it whereby you uh, successfully introduced a bill into the Arizona legislature uh, in response to something that happened to a colleague of yours. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, certainly. Um, it, it was actually a colleague that I'd worked with at one of the hospitals uh, in Arizona, um, out in rural Arizona, and he was um, at the nursing station and noticed that they had a non-medical person watching the telemonitors. So he, he had told the administration of the hospital that that, that isn't appropriate. That person wouldn't know uh, what they were looking at. Um, and, and so um, when, when he appropriately, he did the right thing, he appropriately put it up the chain, they, they found a way to, to get rid of him. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and they did that. The chain. What's that? It went back down the chain and he was... Anyway, yeah. and, and so um, he, he was pretty upset about how that had gone down. I mean, he was, he was basically removed from the schedule from a, from a contract medical group. So um, he, he, was, he was kind of upset about it and he came to me and he, and he said, uh, look, you're, you're in, in the legislature. How, how does this work? Well, the law, the way the law was written in Arizona, it, it said that the, the hospital couldn't terminate you. But, well, but as we know now, you know, the marketplace has changed quite a lot and the hospital may not employ the physician. It, it's usually through some kind of third party, like a contract medical group. Well, um, that there was no real protection from retaliation. So I said, well, we, we can, we can do that. We can change the law. And, um, so I had him come down to the legislature. I, I authored the bill, um, and, and I, you know, got it together as a draft. And, was, and this, was this your first bill through the legislature? No, I've, I've had I've I've had several. Yeah, I've I've been in office um, now for going on three years. This is my fourth mm -hmm. year. Um, the session just started, so it's my fourth year. So over the course of these three years, I've I've really learned how to build a lot of relationships, get to know a lot of people, and and try to take good ideas and, and push them through the legislature. It's a point of pride for me because a lot of politics isn't that these days. Um, you know, you get, a lot of people get hung up on the D and the R and, and rather than doing that, it, it's, it's really important to focus on the problems that people are having and, and trying to just, just in, in some way, trying to take their problems, hear their voices and, and put solutions forward. So um, yeah, I've, I've been lucky. I've had uh, bipartisan bills go through um, for the last three years. Um, so, you know, having those relationships really helps. I mean, that's, that's the, the, you know, the, the political capital, social capital you need in order to go out there and try to, to actually make change. And um, so we, we, um, uh, we met with the folks who are in positions of power behind the scenes. He didn't want to testify in public. So I brought him into the office of the Speaker of the House um, and others. And I said, you know, meet my friend here. I'd like you to hear his story and, and what happened. And, and so telling that story um, allowed them to understand why this was a problem and, and convinced uh, many of the folks that, that this is in fact a, a really good bill and a really good law to, to push forward. So we were able to push it through the House and then push it through the Senate and the governor signed it earlier, like 
um, in the middle of uh, 2021. So it doesn't sound like there was a lot of op opposition uh, to it. Not a lot. Um, we, d we did have to, of course, contact the hospitals. Um, there's, there's a hospital, there's a group. I mean, for every, everybody in society, there's, there's some yeah. representation yeah. there usually. And so we contacted them. And, and the way we, we do this is, is not by ramming the bill uh, right through them, but, but by inviting them to the table, asking them to look at it and say, do you have any objections? What are your concerns? And, and they had some. So we worked with them finessed the language to the point where they also felt comfortable with it. And they said, no, you know, you're, you're, you're working with us and we appreciate that. So we're just going to, you know, we'll change it up a little bit and, and uh, support it as it goes on through. So that was, that was really wonderful. Can you give us an idea of what some of the concerns were? It was legal. Um, I think that what they didn't want to have happen was to be responsible for that third party. So depending on how you write the, the technical language, um, perhaps the hospital could be seen to be liable for the actions of the third party. So that was where their concerns came in. They said that, you know, we're, we don't really, we want to be kept separate legally from, from those third parties that are doing what they're doing. I was curious that whether the large contract management groups would have tried to intervene uh, because uh, this is a toe in the water. Plus they, in Arizona, they probably have a reasonable number of contracts as well. Well, you know, part of it, excuse me, <clears throat> part of it is that um, when you make laws like this, it, it affects everybody throughout the marketplace evenly. Um, and if everybody in, in the space is subject to the same sort of requirements, then it's less of an issue uh, as they compete with one another. And, and I think that that mitigates it somewhat because, because they'll say, well, I mean, if, if group A can't do it, group B can't do it, then we're all sort of in that same place and it's a level playing field. And, and so I've seen a lot of that happen and, and that's, that's a good thing. Are you aware of how many states currently have similar laws in place? That's a really great question. No, I, I'm not. Um, what uh, I do know though, is that thanks to the efforts of some of the folks on the ASAP board, the Arizona ASAP board, um, specifically Dr. Gokova and Dr. Becky Parker, that what we did was we drafted a resolution this past year and took it to ASAP National, submitted it, and I believe it passed. And, and so what that resolution does is um, direct ASAP to pursue this bill. The bill was 2622, I believe, um, from 2021, uh, to pursue it at all of the state houses across the country and federally so that everybody can have a law similar to this. So I'm, I'm, you know, what we did was we formally had ASAP recognize that this bill was important across the country. Do you think that folks will be as successful locally without having the same kind of um, individual storyteller that you did on hand? Um, that remains to be seen. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of it is, is the local mix. Uh, having a physician though, um, it doesn't have to be an emergency physician. Having a physician in the legislature probably will, will make a difference. Now, in this case, I am the only physician in the legislature. I be believe I'm the only healthcare worker in the Arizona legislature. So it, it certainly helps because you open a window into our world for, for these folks. Um, and, um, and, and that's part of actually getting to my message, which is to, to people out there all over the country. Um, I would really love to see emergency physicians running for office all over the country because that's how we can make these kinds of changes happen. We, we've, we've seen over a, a generation, lots of changes to the practice of medicine and specifically emergency medicine. Um, and if you want to be part of the solution, part of it is that you have to be, you have to have a seat at the table. And, and so this, this really um, is, is sort of a uh, broader message for emergency physicians all over the country Think about running. You can be a good citizen, and and serve your country, and 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 also do a lot of good and and represent our profession. Well, you're in session now, which means uh, uh, four days a week that you have to kind of be at the Capitol and uh, do the work of the legislature together. Correct. And, Typically, it's Monday through Thursday, eight to six. And that's um, in person now. Um. Mm. That's a good question. Uh, we are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, we are currently uh, doing a hybrid model whereby it's, it's mostly in person, but if, if you have 
an illness. If, if, if COVID, if you have COVID, you, you can be in your office. Uh, I think there are some limited abilities to participate via Zoom. Over the last couple of years, we, we have done a lot more Zoom uh, at the legislature. Uh, so it, it used to have to be in person all the time, but things have changed a little bit in the current environment. Do you have any other bills uh, in the hopper, as they say? Uh, um, and uh, so I, I do, in fact. Um, I as you can probably imagine, I run a lot of the health bills. Uh, my yes. over, over the last three years, my, my biggest agenda since I got down there was um, taking people at the grassroots level, doctors, nurses, all, in fact, all healthcare workers, and trying to make sure that they live healthy and happy lives and, and that they find their work enjoyable and sustainable, right? So we, we don't want people burning out. And, and that's the umbrella under which I approached ASAP and as well as uh, the Arizona Medical Association, as well as the Arizona Nurses Association and all of the other healthcare groups. And I said, it, we, we have to take care of one another. We have to take care of healthcare workers. Um, so broadly, a lot of this falls under the burnout umbrella. Um, the other bill that actually was signed into law last year that I brought forward um, was the prior authorization reform bill. Now, as ER docs, we, we don't get into that so much, but our, our colleagues in, in other specialties are really suffering mm -hmm. from, from the prior authorization issue. Insurance, if, if you don't, for those ER docs that don't know out there, the insurance company will request a prior authorization um, for, for things that you wanna do like MRIs or surgical procedures. Um, that, that process gets really cumbersome really fast, especially if you have a host of insurance companies and a ton of different doctor's offices. So, what we did was we introduced a bill to standardize that process across the entire industry. A single two-page form has to be used by everybody, every insurance company and every physician. So it massively cuts down the amount of paperwork, administrative costs, training, a, a, a huge boon to, to all of the physicians across Arizona um, and reducing patient delay. So, so, and actually the insurance companies even, even liked it because they said, well, same thing. We, we can't get together and do it together because that would be collusion. But if the government says and, and we do it, it actually simplifies things on our back end as well. So it improves their customer service. And, and, and so that, that was a really great win. That, that bill was also signed into law earlier this year. Um, we, um, I, I have a few others that I'm working on. Um, there is one that was brought to me, uh, well, under, again, under the burnout umbrella, I've been working for the last three years on a bill to reduce assault in the emergency department. This, this is specifically the nurses are the most interested in this one. Um, you know, the rates of our nursing colleagues getting assaulted in the ER is somewhere like 100%. So al almost every ER nurse, if, if they work long enough, will get assaulted in the ER. Um, and what, what we did was we, we got together, again, huge stakeholder group, brought everybody in. Not everybody was happy with this one, but what we, what we said was we, we were gonna put in some administrative changes um, so that the hospitals track and trace these assaults, similar to like needle sticks. If you've ever gotten a needle stick, you know that somebody's tracking you. But, but assaults are just sort of brushed under the, I mean, the nurses really felt that they were being dismissed. Um, and, and so um, we wanted to make sure that there was signage saying that if you assault a healthcare worker, there will be a felony associated with it. We uh, wanted to up the penalty. Currently, it's a, it's a class six felony, which is the lowest level felony to assault a healthcare worker. It's a class five felony just for reference to abuse an animal like a dog or a cat in Arizona. So it, we, we wanted to bring that up to a class five because it couldn't be brought down to a misdemeanor. And that, that's what happens a lot. People are just let free and then they come back again and stalk the nurse or the doctor or whatever. Um, that kind of stuff is not what we want happening. So, so the assault bill is something I've passed through the house for the last three years in a row. And again, we're trying for the fourth year to get it through. We've, we've had a little trouble getting it through certain, you know, a couple individuals. Um, and, and then, um, you know, a, a whole host of other, other health, I mean, I could, I could talk to you forever. I've probably got another half an hour worth of bills that I could talk to you about, but yeah, all, all kind of under that burnout umbrella, all for, for grassroots efforts for healthcare workers. It seems that the assault bill would be kind of like apple pie and motherhood and that there wouldn't be anybody pushing back on assaulting healthcare workers. Oh, you're in favor of assaulting healthcare workers. You know, it's like hard, hard, hard to understand that. Rachel, tell us about what happened last night to you. I don't know if I can anonymize it appropriately. Um, no, I, it was it's not a very gratifying night in the emergency department. Not a lot of emergencies and a lot of angry patients, which I think is not atypical these days. Um, but uh, 
and I was, before you got on, I was telling Rick about one fairly belligerent patient who is more verbally aggressive than physically. But uh, I had a question for you, actually, for people that may be thinking about taking your advice and following your path. I think that one question they might have is kind of upfront, how much of a time commitment is this? You know, I don't think people are going to want to be quitting their jobs to pursue what you're doing if there's no kind of promise of a job at the other end. But as far as um, running for office, what did that look like for you? Did you hold a job during that? Did you have to kind of stop what you were doing and stop the rest of your life? What was that process? I've been continually in practice throughout. I've I've never stopped practicing medicine. So um, yes, you you do have to cut back. Running for office means it's it's a it's a full time commitment. It, it it is not something that that can be done as like part time or part of your life. Um, it 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 really requires, especially if you want to win. Um, and that was for months, for six months, for how long? Um, the first time I ran. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, of course nobody knows you. And so you, you have to, the, the initial campaign will have to be even bigger and, and, um, require a lot more effort, but I, I did it a little bit differently as some people can run campaigns in very different ways, but my campaign was focused on getting to know the individual voters. Um, and to that end, what I did was starting about 18 months prior to the election, um, I started knocking on people's doors one by one individually. Um, I did this five days a week from um, about 10 a.m. every morning to sunset um, as if it was a full-time job. Um, I would practice medicine about one day a week. So I obviously took a big cut to the income. Um, and then one day I would just take completely off. But five days a week, uh, I would start at about 10 o'clock. I would show up at somebody's door and I would just keep knocking door after door after door until the sun went down. And I did that for 18 straight months. And I knocked on 8,034 doors with no volunteers. I, I um, you know, I, I just shook their hands. I sat in their living rooms. I spoke to people one-on-one and, and I said to the voters, I, I, I just really want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you care about. And, and I want to represent you in, in the legislature. Well, um, I, you know, I, I didn't do a lot of this, you know, get on TV or get on the radio or throw a lot of Facebook ads or I didn't I didn't do any of that stuff. And I won in a landslide in, in, in the election when the when the election came around, only because I'd, I'd actually spent the time to get to know all of the voters and, and, and be at their doors and, and, and speak to them face to face one on one. So uh, I would say that if you really want to win, then you have to make a real commitment for your entire life. This, this is, it's, it is hard. I'm not going to say it's easy to do this. It's really hard. If your spouse doesn't want you to do this, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> if uh, I'm not married, uh, if, if you have, uh, you know, skeletons in your closet, a DUI, I don't know, whatever, don't do it. It's, it's, it's not really uh, a great idea because everything about you becomes public. Everybody will research everything about you. And, and then, yeah, honestly, it's politics. So people will try to uh, highlight some of those things, unfortunately. And that's, that's kind of the way it goes. Um, so no, it's, it isn't for everybody. Um, and, and it requires a massive, massive amount of time and commitment. And then once you get in, if you win, um, you know, the legislature pays me $24,000 a year. That's my salary. And, and it, it is, like I said, it, is, it consumes almost all of your How life. How much do you say 24? $24,000 a year is my salary, yeah. In the legislature. Okay. So I'm lucky. Emergency physicians are actually very lucky in that they can tailor their schedule around everything yeah. else. So you can still work one to two days a week. <clears throat> the state legislature happens to be part time. So we're in from January through around May. Uh, and then the rest of the year, um, if it's a, an, especially if it's an odd numbered year where there's no election, you can actually spend that time making money and, and generating some income. So, so that's, that's also good. Um, so you, you have to, you have to be really flexible and find your way around it. It, it isn't possible for a lot of physicians who have to have that practice where you're there nine to five. Right. So it, it, um, you know, but emergency physicians are, are actually well set up, uh, if, if this is something you want to do, but I, I'm not going to make light of the, the sheer amount of time, uh, that, that it takes to do something like this. Rachel, that was a, um, a, that was a really 
pretty smooth pivot away from my question on what happened to you last night. Because the reason I want to ask that is because if I could go back to that is that sometimes people get upset in the emergency department and become verbally abusive for sure. I don't know that they'll touch anybody in the process, but they, when, when their loved ones are kind of like in a, in a, um, a bad situation and uh, they they think that something's not happening as quickly as it should or you know why can't you you know why, why isn't there an ambulance to transfer them sooner kind of thing or or you know concerns that are legitimate but be, become blown up so that now this person who would no- normally be a mild manner clark kent kind of guy is uh is is become um losing starts losing it and it it's not that they so the issue about what is assault, I mean, I, um, it, does it have to be something physical to be assaulted with, or, or is it could, could just be, you know, verbal? I mean, if, I don't know if this is for me or Rachel, but, but I'm, the legal definition is that you, you don't, for, for assault, you don't actually have to make physical contact. Right. Threatening somebody, and this is just the law. I mean, it, it, threatening somebody, to the point where they would believe a reasonable person would believe that they are about to be um, mm-hmm. physically hurt is meets the definition of assault. So the signage is key uh, so that when somebody starts to accelerate and, uh, and things get out of a hand of it, you can point to the sign kind of thing and say, you are now in the felony felony territory. Well, you hope you hope that it's when it's displayed prominently in ent- at entrances and other places all over, right. people will at least kind of see that and and know up front that okay that this is this is real and this isn't right. the way we behave. Hopefully, it stops a lot of it before it starts. The, the other part of the law was also that we would have these healthcare workers do a lot of de-escalation training and, and, and work with people on how to diffuse these types of situations. That was all that, all that administrative stuff is all in the law or in the bill. Yeah, excuse me. I would think it would need to be. I think the other thing too, is there are, there are a couple of signs that really uh, I think are important. You know, the other one is like about no photography, uh, no re- uh, recording or uh, video recording, audio recording in the, is permitted in the emergency department. Because sometimes that becomes a sticky thing when, you know, somebody wants you to watch you do a procedure and you'd rather not do that. And you could just help point, point to the sign. You know, it's really about the privacy of patients, but it's actually a little bit more than that. Uh, Rachel? Yes, sir. Anything further? No, this has been enlightening. I'm feeling inspired to quit my job. No, not quite, but... <laughs> Today you are, that's for sure, after the shift of the shift you you had this looks like what anything looks better than your last your last by the, by the way, my 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 purpose was never to inspire people to quit their jobs. <laughs> just just so you, you all know. I mean, I'm not trying to I'm trying to get people to stay in emergency medicine, but but also spend some of their time in got it, got it outside. So I, I don't want anybody taking away the wrong message here. <laughs> that's what I meant. Sorry. I'm yes. <laughs> and as an aside, you mentioned that you were with the uh, NFL a little bit. You probably know Tom Mayer. Who- um, yeah, he he was the, the gentleman who was working for the players' union, I believe. Right, uh, right. He's the chief doctor for the players' union, mm-hmm. and um, uh, interesting fellow. He's an emergency physician that has been very influential in uh, emergency medicine over the time, and he's written he's written a book recently about. Burnout and Resilience, uh, which he's basically, I just talked to him and he's going to send me a copy because it's kind of a, that's a, a, that's a thread that runs behind so much of emergency medicine these days. And it's, um, it's so distressing to see all of our colleagues or many of our colleagues having a real hard time with this job and this career. They've got 35 years of this to go. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank I- you very much. Oh, I, I just want to uh, tell you about a quote. The, the, when I first started at Mount Sinai, uh, there's a great emergency physician, well-known uh, by the name of Sheldon Jacobson. And he was the chair when I started there. And, and when I was in the interview, I remember him telling me, here's the deal. I take care of you. You take care of the patients. And it, that, that, it, it, it echoes from the house of God, where, whereby I remember a line in that book that, that says, well, if nobody takes care of us, how can we take care of other people? Um, so 
part of the reason I'm doing this is, is because I, I think I'm trying to stay true to the, the legacy and the wisdom that was given to me by a very senior emergency physician that we, we've got to take care of one another. I, I, a lot of my efforts here are meant to take care of physicians and healthcare workers um, because we, we need to take care of them. Somebody needs to take care of them as they take care of others. Um, and, and, and that's the way in which I, I believe uh, that, that we, we really can um, mitigate the burnout situation. Rachel, it's time for you to go back to bed now. Yeah. Uh, this was worth getting up for. Honestly, this was, this was inspiring. It's so, inspiring, exactly. Cool. That's exactly right. And it's so nice to show other physicians what has been done and what they, what they can do. But the idea of interviewing 8,034 of your uh, constituency is... Um, 18,000, 18,000, right? No, uh, 8,034 doors in my first campaign. Since that time, I continue to knock doors. So I, I, it's, it's really the only way we campaign go door to door. In fact, might go do it later today and, and just go house to house to house and, and try to meet everybody and, and talk well, to them. And, and so it's, it's been over. I mean, I think we're, we're well over 12 or 13,000 doors by this point. Wow. Dr. Shah, so much. Uh, we're appreciative for everything that you've told us about in terms of your bill, your career in the legislature. Your, uh, it's very inspiring for sure. And legislate, uh, I think Rachel's ex and anticipating putting her hat, throwing her hat in the ring. <laughs> Can't wait. Thanks so much. You. Yeah. Then you, you, we need another position in the legislature down here. Yes, we do. I have a feeling, Dr. Shah, that you're not going to be stopping at the Arizona legislature. Uh, I, have a, <laughs> I have a feeling that this is just the beginning of a very interesting career. Thanks so much for being with us. No, no further questions. Thank you. <laughs>